Buried next to me now in the rural foothills of southern Appalachia is John A. Merle, who, if stories are to be believed, and Mark Twain actually wrote these stories as well, was about to lead a rebellion that would have established a slave state from the northern reaches of the Mississippi River all the way down to New Orleans with its capital right there and its leader, John Morrell. Now, in order to understand Merle's upbringing, understand he was born in Virginia to a Methodist preacher father and a mother who was involved with some seedy business. They moved to rural Tennessee, presumably so the father could get on horseback and minister to the rural folks here, as well as probably the Native Americans. After all, it was the very early 1800s before Indian removal. So John Merle and his brothers gravitated towards their mother because their father was always away. The mother, supposedly, according to the legend in the pamphlet published by Vincent Stewart, taught them how to steal taught them how to pick pockets and be outlaws. And at a very young age, John Merle was a teenager, he was sentenced to six years in prison and branded H.T. for horse thief. When he got out, he was a hardened criminal and went to the Natchez Trace to become the great Western land pirate. Now, the situation on the ground geographically and just societally was perfect for this because there were no steamboats. It was before the advent of the steamboat and traders on the upper reaches of the Mississippi River would come all the way down floating their goods on, on logs, sell that in New Orleans or Natchez, and then walk usually to uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And all that way along the old Natchez Trace, they're pretty much unprotected if they're traveling in smaller groups and John Merle and his band would prey on them. Now, John Merle in 1834 was caught as a part of the reverse underground railroad. What he would do once he built his gang up a little bit bigger was he would go and kidnap slaves and sell them somewhere else. So this is a very, very bad man we're dealing with and he doesn't necessarily like black people, which is important to note because the claims around him say that he wanted to establish a free state for slaves after an uprising. And keep in mind, only a few years prior, Nat Turner's uprising in Virginia took place. So Southerners, once they read this pamphlet, had what was called the Merle Excitement. And in 1834, Merle was put in prison. But in 1835, another man, Augustus Q. Uh, Walton Esquire, clearly fake name, it's, it's just Vincent Stewart, publishes a book detailing his involvement with the Mystic Clan. And he says that Walton, or he says that uh, Merle led this mystic clan of anywhere between several hundred men to 1,500 men, and later newspapers would report 2,500 men. He claimed that this uprising was going to take place on Christmas Day, 1835, without Merle present, and that they were going to seize the entire American South, go free Merle, and make him their leader. So naturally, what happened was just a panic all along the Deep South and the Mississippi River and the Natchez Trace. And specifically, the panic was concerning men who were from out of town, which of course was pretty much everyone. Imagine this happening nowadays on a highway town. Of course, you're going to see a lot of truckers who aren't normally there just passing through. And that's exactly what happened. 20 slaves and 10 white men in Mississippi were hanged in one go because of this, because they were accused of being members of John Merle's Mystic Clan. And then in Vicksburg, they hanged six gamblers who, in all likelihood, had just traded their goods, spending, were spending their money, and were going to go back north on the Natchez Trace to engage in that Mississippi River trade. Now, he died in 1844 after a decade in prison and only lived for a few months after being released because, again, that Auburn penitentiary method was ball and chain, wearing uniforms even when you sleep, almost no food, no speaking unless spoken to, which was never, and solitary confinement in a cell barely bigger than a coffin. So it broke John Morrell, but he did admit that most of the stories were true. He claimed he wanted to initiate some form of a rebellion. Now, when Merle died, he was such a local celebrity that local townspeople came and dug his grave up and robbed all his bones. His skull is still missing. Some of his bones are buried here, and the Tennessee State Museum still owns his finger his trigger finger, which was a very common thing to steal for grave robbers back in the day, for outlaws, and they show it off to the public once a year. But now it's pretty commonly agreed upon that there were no 2,500 people, and any real plan they had at a large-scale rebellion was wishful thinking at best. Modern day assessments show that he was a part of this outlaw gang, that they probably did actually stop some of the shipments coming down south on the Mississippi and wipe out the entire shipping crew, but that 
at most they were inept horse thieves, at least in the local area, because their father went in debt bailing them out time and time and time again. And in reality, this is just something which drew a great excitement and became an inspiration, even for men like Mark Twain, who featured John Merle and his life along the Mississippi River quite prominently, saying that he had a gall in the brutality that was unmatched even by Jesse James.